Welcome! In this video, we're going to cover informal proof theory, which is how to write proofs in natural language. The word informal here isn't meant as a pejorative. In fact, most of the proofs you'll be encountering in books or in papers are written in this informal style. However, the idea is that in principle, these informal proofs could be translated into formal versions in some logical system. Now, for most mathematical statements, first order logic is sufficient. However, there are some cases where one isn't quantifying over just elements of a set, but rather over like subsets of a set and so on. And then one needs to resort to some sort of higher order logic. However, most mathematicians aren't thinking about these sort of things when they're writing proofs. Instead, they just have internalized a set of rules which apply for this type of informal proof writing. And if you follow these rules, then your proof is considered to be correct. So one way for thinking about writing these informal proofs is sort of like a game which has a specified set of rules. And the aim of the game is to prove your statement while following those rules. On the other hand, the reason the rules make sense from a logical perspective, well, that's something we would establish in the study of mathematical logic. And we would then show that whenever we use these rules that we do indeed get valid proofs. In this video, when I present the rules of proof, I will justify why they make sense. However, because we're in this informal setting, it won't be entirely precise. Before getting to the actual rules that we'll be using to write proofs, I'm going to present some style guidelines and some tips for your own proof writing. As I mentioned, these informal proofs are basically communication devices between mathematicians. So they appear in either books or papers when one mathematician tries to explain something for others. So the primary purpose of these informal proofs is to convince other people, including yourself. This means that a proof that is essentially technically correct, but very unclear is not really fulfilling its purpose. Hence, it's important when writing your own proofs to always keep the reader of your proof in mind. And even if no one besides yourself will ever read the proof, it's still a good idea to keep these style guidelines in place so that uh, you can understand your own thoughts more clearly. The first point here says to write correct English and to express yourself clearly. So as I said, because proofs are a communication device and they're phrased in natural language, you should follow the grammar and conventions of that language. In particular, this means you should write entire sentences and you should also use the same principles you would if you were writing some sort of other type of text document. In some cases, however, it can be a good idea to bend the rules of the grammar of your language slightly for instance, I personally like to include more commas in my proofs than you would usually in English. Also, sometimes when you're mixing language and maybe some formulas, it can look weird to put the proper punctuation everywhere. So in these cases, you probably just have to kind of develop your own style. But sort of the, the main consideration is that bending the rules of the grammar should make your mathematical arguments clearer and easier to read rather than more difficult. This brings me to the second point, which says that you should tell your readers exactly what you're doing in your proof. Clearly, when you're writing the proof yourself, you should know what you're doing, but your reader might not. So it's important to always say what you're trying to do in each step of the proof. This doesn't have to be very involved, but some simple phrases like Next, we will show that, and, and that kind of thing will really make your proof a lot easier to read. A similar point is the following, that you should always say what you mean when you're introducing new variable names. This means that whenever you have a new variable which comes up in your proof, you should say what it represents in words. This is helpful even if you're defining the variable through a formula. As an example, suppose you want to introduce a variable which is defined as the difference between y and z. Then instead of just saying let x equals y minus z, you could write something like let x equals y minus z denote the difference between y and z. Admittedly, in this case, the definition of x is very simple, so probably no one's going to misunderstand what you mean by x. But if x becomes more complicated and its definition becomes more complicated, it's often helpful to have a description of the variable in terms of words that the reader understands conceptually what you're trying to do with this variable. As a fourth point, you shouldn't start your sentences with symbols. So this is sort of keeping in line with writing proper natural language. You should always start your sentences with like words rather than with symbols. Sometimes this requires kind of restructuring your sentence in order to make this work out. 
but the advantage of this is that it'll make your proofs a lot more readable. Another thing you should avoid is writing too many formulas or in the worst case, writing only formulas. So again, an informal proof is supposed to be like a thing which is a piece of writing in some language. So just writing formulas is not going to cut it. Instead, the formulas which you do include your proof should be surrounded by text, which explains why they're there and what they're saying. Moreover, it's a good idea to put the formulas in such a place that a reader can quickly see and read them. In this way, if someone just wants to quickly look over your proof, they can just kind of read the formulas and maybe see what's going on. But if they're less experienced and they don't understand what's going on, they can refer to the text, which should give more context and explain yeah, what's going on in the formulas in more detail. As a final rule, you should use words like thus, therefore, hence, and it follows to link up the different parts of your proof. In particular, if you want to say something like therefore, you should write the word therefore and not just put like an implication symbol or something like that. Instead of writing the symbol, you can say something like thus or therefore and hence and so on. And this will give the reader an idea of what the logical structure is of your argument, but without using these symbols. Similarly, if outside of a formula, you want to say something like for all, you should write for all in words and not just write the logical quantifier for all. And the same goes for there exists. So these symbols here really only should be part of formulas in your proof and they shouldn't occur in the text that uh, explains and gives context to those formulas. Okay, so these are just some guidelines for you to write proofs. You don't strictly have to follow them, but it's a good idea because as I said, proofs are supposed to be like a communication device and these guidelines will help you write communicative proofs that really convey the idea you're trying to explain. I'll follow up these style guidelines with some tips that might be helpful when you're starting out writing proofs. The first tip is to use this schema here when you're trying to figure out how to write a proof. So it has three parts. The first part are the givens. So under given, you would write down all the assumptions you have. And then under the to be proved, you should write the statement which you need to prove. And then finally, under the proof point, you should start writing your proof. This is especially helpful in the beginning when you haven't yet completely gotten used to all of the proof rules and you need some help keeping track of what's actually going on during the proof. The second tip is to use layout to identify subproofs. So sometimes within a proof, you'll have to prove some simpler statement. So in this case, you might start out with sort of your main proof, but then inside the main proof, there might be a smaller proof which occurs. Now to differentiate between these two parts, so there's basically different scope. So in the smaller proof, you're allowed to use all of the assumptions from outside, but you might have more assumptions than in the outside. So it's kind of similar to when you're defining functions in a programming language. If you define a function inside a function, all of the variables you have in the outside function sort of are inherited to the inside function, but not the other way around. So programming languages need ways of keeping track sort of what the level of nesting is, and a similar thing goes for proof writing. So when you're starting out, it's a good idea to sort of differentiate these different levels by either using maybe boxes or like indentation level in your writing. Eventually you'll get used to sort of knowing in which part of the proof you're at and well, you'll just write like normal blocks of text for your proof rather than having this different levels of indentation. But this is something that can be very helpful um, when you start out. The next point is that you should look up all the definitions that occur in your set of givens. Now, in many cases, when you're trying to prove a statement, you'll need to know what the terms in the statement actually mean. And so it's always a good idea to look up the definition and maybe replace the defined terms in the givens with their actual definitions. So somehow you want to, as a first step, always expand the givens and the, the statement to be proved out into more basic form where you can see exactly what you need to be proving. There are cases where this is a bad idea, like where you could have left things more compact and still managed to do the proof. But in many cases, you actually do need to, in the first step, expand the statement out into sort of what it actually means before you can go about proving it. The final few points concern how you should go about actually writing these proofs. 
So one good idea is to always make a neat final version of your proof once you've completed it. So it's tempting to, once you understand why a thing is true and how to prove it, it's tempting to just kind of skip writing down a nice version of it. But especially in the beginning, it's good for practice to really have sort of a final version which you could present to someone. Along these lines, you should also not expect to manage to write a correct proof on your first try or even on your second or third try. So most of the time you'll start out writing a proof and then somehow you'll get stuck and you'll make a mistake and then you might have to like start over and then you might notice, oh, this idea or this way of going about it is not working, so I need to try something else and so on. So you'll fiddle around with your proof until finally you get a version that you think is correct. And at that point, it's a good idea to write that version down neatly. And then once you have this final version, you can sleep on it so you can take some time off from thinking about it and then review it maybe the next day and see whether it still makes sense and whether it's understandable. Often when you look at your proof for a second time, you might notice that there's some gap in it or that something you thought was correct isn't actually quite correct or that basically some part of it is unclear because now that you've forgotten a bit what was going on, um, you see that actually the thing you wrote down doesn't completely describe what you were thinking. If you're learning this stuff for the first time, the most important thing to keep in mind is that it's a pretty difficult skill you're learning. So it'll take, it'll take a while for you to get used to um, doing this properly. This means you should be patient with yourself. So whenever you're learning new math, you should always be very patient with yourself. And whenever things seem sort of frustrating or difficult, you should remind yourself that, well, humans haven't evolved to do math per se. So what we're trying to do here is something that doesn't really come naturally to us. And so it's, uh, yeah, it's gonna be hard. Now, although I'll be giving you all the rules you'll need to write proper proofs, if you're seeing this for the first time, you'll probably need extra practice problems and also additional examples in order to fully internalize this. So for this, I'm going to give you a reference to a book which does exactly that. So it's a, basically a book length treatment of these rules. So it's by uh, Velemon, and it's called um, How to Prove It. And well, it covers the material from this video in like, yeah, book length detail, basically. In particular, it has a ton of practice problems that give you easy problems that you can prove yourself. So the math behind those problems isn't particularly difficult, but it'll give you um, a lot of practice in, you know, just knowing how to prove specific statements if they have a specific logical form. In any case, when I was learning this stuff, I spent many weeks working on the problems in this book, and I think it really helped me to develop a good uh, proof style. Okay, let's now turn to the actual proof rules we'll be using to construct proofs. In principle, there'll be two rules for each of the connectives in first order logic. So there'll be an introduction rule and an elimination rule. The introduction rule will be used if the connective appears in the statement that is to be proved, whereas the elimination rule will be used if the connective occurs in one of our givens. At the moment, this might still seem a bit mysterious, but we'll see exactly what I'm talking about in each of the cases. Let's start with our first connective, which is going to be implication. And recall that we wrote implication using this single arrow notation. Let's first describe the introduction rule. So as I mentioned before, introduction rules have to do with proving a given statement. Here, the introduction rule says that if we want to prove a statement of the form capital Phi implies capital Psi, well, then we assume uh, capital Phi. So we add capital Phi to our givens and we prove capital Psi based on this additional assumption. So here, in fact, this introduction rule has a special name. It's called uh, deduction rule. Or in the context of formal logic, it's called deduction theorem because it's a theorem that one proves. Let's see how this introduction rule works in the context of a proof. So for our proof, we'll have some givens. Um, I'm not gonna say exactly what these are, but the important thing in order to use this rule is that 
the statement we want to prove should have the form uh, phi implies psi for some arbitrary formulas capital phi and capital psi. And in this case, our proof will start with the following phrase. So we're going to suppose that capital phi holds. So as the introduction rule says, we're now assuming that in fact, this thing phi does hold. And the remaining thing we need to prove is going to be this formula um, capital psi. And suppose that I can come up with a proof of capital psi based on the additional assumption that capital phi holds. So here in this sub proof, I'm allowed to use all of the givens I had in the original uh, proof, but I'm now also allowed to use um, capital phi. So assume that I managed to write down a proof that from these gibbons and capital phi establishes psi. Well, then I have proved um, the implication. So I can write, therefore, phi implies psi. Okay, before seeing a more concrete example, let's think briefly about why this rule makes sense. For this, we have to think back to the truth table of implication. So remember that an implication is trivially true if the hypotheses are false. And otherwise, it's true if the hypotheses are true and the conclusions are true. And the only case where an implication is false is when, in fact, the hypotheses are true and the conclusion is false. So basically, the only case we have to be worried about is when phi might be true, but psi could in principle be false. However, here with this introduction rule, we're explicitly saying that that case can't happen because we're assuming that phi is true and then we're proving psi, so we're proving that also psi is true. So we're showing that whenever phi is true, then psi is true. This means that we've already covered two cases in the truth table, so we've covered the case whenever phi is true. So we've shown that in that case, always psi is true. So in that case, the implication as a whole will be true. On the other hand, we haven't covered the case where capital phi is false, but we know that in that case, the implication is true by default. So really, we don't have to worry about that case at all when we're trying to prove an implication. So perhaps a more complete argument here would be, okay, we want to prove that capital phi implies capital psi, so first suppose that capital phi is false. Well, in that case, the um, implication holds by default. Otherwise, assume that capital phi is true. And in that case, we prove that psi is also true. And therefore, the implication is also true as a whole. And we don't have this case where the premises are true and potentially the conclusions would be false. Okay, so let's give a more concrete example than the one on the left, which is sort of just a schema for how to apply these things. So suppose we have the following things given. So we're given the implication P implies Q and also Q implies R. And now we want to prove that in this case, also P implies R. So if you think about these statements here, it's saying that, well, if we have both of these implications, then we can sort of go from P to Q and then go from Q to R. And so we've also have that uh, P implies R. So this is basically saying that implication is transitive. All right, so now let's write a proof for this. The first thing we notice is that the statement we're trying to prove is an implication. So this introduction rule for the implication connective applies. So in order to prove this implication P implies R, we're going to assume the hypotheses of the implication and try to prove R based on our givens. So the proof is going to be, well, suppose that P holds and we need to show, so the remaining thing we need to show is that R holds. And now I'm going to write a sub proof for R based now on the additional assumption that P holds. And as I said before, we're allowed to use the existing givens we have in the more outer scope of the proof. Okay, so how is this subproof going to go? So I'm going to write 
since p is true, um, and also p implies q, um, we have, uh, well, that q is true. Okay, and moreover, since q is true, and q implies r, we must have r. Okay, and now we've done what we've set out to do. So we wanted to prove r based on the additional hypothesis p together with our original uh, givens. So now I can conclude. So therefore, p implies r. And that's what I wanted to show in the outermost scope of the proof. And so this concludes uh, the proof of this statement. Now here in this subproof, I've in fact used the second rule for implication, namely the elimination rule, which says that whenever we have an implication like so, so like P implies Q, and we know that the hypotheses are true, then we also know that the conclusion must be true. I'll discuss this in more detail in just a moment when I introduce this elimination rule properly. But for the moment, just think back to the truth table for implication. So we know that whenever the hypothesis is true, the implication is true exactly when also the conclusions are true. So if in fact P were true and Q were false, well then the implication would also be false. So the only case where the implication is true and the hypotheses are true uh, occurs when also the conclusions are true. Hence, whenever we have this case where we know the hypotheses and we also know the implication, then we get to conclude the conclusions. In fact, that's exactly what implication is supposed to do. It's supposed to somehow transform your hypotheses into conclusions. So here to review the entire structure of this proof. So we want to prove this implication. We suppose the hypothesis, and now we can basically plug in the hypothesis into this given to get Q. And then, well, we can plug in Q into this implication to get R, and that overall proves that P implies R. At this point, I should also note that, well, this type of writing here isn't really considered good style if you're trying to write like proofs in books or papers. For the moment, we're just adding like a bunch of additional structure with this given and this to prove and so on in order to make the structure of the proof more apparent while we're learning these rules. Later on, you'll want to rewrite these proofs in a more friendly format, so more reader friendly. For example, you'll say something like, Suppose that P holds, then since P is true and we have the implication P implies Q, we can conclude that Q is true. And now since Q is true and this implication holds, we have that R is true, therefore P implies R. So you would just put that all in like one block of text um, where you describe these sort of structure words here inside the text. As a final remark, I should mention that this phrase here, suppose that P holds, or assume that P holds, this is indicative that you're using the introduction rule. So you shouldn't write in your proof, we're now using the introduction rule to prove the implication. Rather, this shorthand, suppose that the premises hold, or assume that the premises hold, this is shorthand and communicates to everyone that you're using the introduction rule now in your proof. If the statement you're trying to prove is clear, so if it's clear that you're trying to prove an implication of this form, then saying that you're assuming the hypotheses automatically means that now you're trying to prove the conclusions. In some cases, however, it can be helpful to say, okay, we suppose that the premises hold, and now we want to prove the following conclusion, and then you proceed with the proof of the conclusion where you're allowed to assume the premises. Okay, so let's now turn to the elimination rule for implication. So it says the following. So if we're given an implication, which has the form capital Phi implies capital Psi, and moreover, we're also given the hypotheses to that implication, well, then we get to conclude the conclusions of the implication. So this is the rule I used twice before in the preceding proof. And the reason it's true is basically by looking at truth tables. So if we know that uh, capital Phi is true, so then we're in the case where the hypotheses for the implication are true, 
And the only case where the implication is true then is if also the conclusions are true. Hence, because we know these two pieces of information, we know that we're in the case of the truth table where also the conclusions need to be true. So this rule also has a name, it's called modus ponens. And in most uh, proof systems, you actually assume this as a axiom. Okay, so let's write down this rule schematically with our structure of the givens. So here there's not really much to write. Um, as I said before, elimination rules transform your givens. So what we're given here is uh, this implication, and we're also separately given uh, the hypotheses to the implication. And well, basically, from these givens, we can just conclude the conclusions. For the sake of clarity, I'll give another example which uses both the introduction and elimination rules for implication. So suppose we're given the following statements. So we know on the one hand that P implies Q, and we also know that P implies that Q implies R, like so. And what we now want to prove is that in fact P implies R. At this point, you might want to treat this as an exercise, so you could pause the video and think about this problem on your own. So see whether you can use the introduction and elimination rules to write down a proof of the statement like I did in the previous example. Or if you're already very familiar with this stuff, then just think about in your head how you would prove the statement P implies R from these givens. So I'm now going to proceed to the solution. So the first step in proving an implication of this form is to assume the givens. So we suppose that P holds, and well, the thing that remains to be proven is R. So we need to still prove R. Now I'm going to write down the proof for R based on, on the one hand, on this additional assumption P, which I'm now allowed to make in this subproof. And also I'm allowed to use these original hypotheses. So now let's see what I can use P for in conjunction with these original hypotheses. So I have now P given, and I also have an implication of the form P implies Q. So using the elimination rule, I can use this to deduce Q. And similarly here, I also have an implication P implies Q implies R. So from this implication together with P, I can get Q implies R. And well, from this previous one, I got Q, and so I can plug in Q here to get R. So that's basically going to be the idea in the proof. You just kind of need to plug in the true variables into the implications and get the, the conclusions. And well, there's just like a single way to do this in this case. All right, so let's write down what I just said. So since P and also, well, this implication, P implies Q, uh, we know that Q holds, okay? And also, since P holds and also this implication P implies Q implies R holds, uh, we know that Q implies R. Now finally, since, well, Q holds, so we've established Q here, so we're allowed to use Q. So since Q and Q implies R holds, uh, we conclude uh, that R holds. So here I've used the elimination rule three times using different combinations of premises and implications. And now we've actually done what we set out to do. So we assumed P and we set out to prove R. And in fact, now I get to conclude R by these elimination rule uses. So therefore, P implies R as desired. Okay, so that wraps up the rules we need for proving implications and also using them. Now I hope that the elimination rule for implication is intuitive. The thing that might not be so intuitive is the introduction rule because yeah, we're somehow skipping the cases where the hypotheses could possibly be false, but well, in those cases, the implication is trivially true. So if that confuses you, just uh, think about for yourself why, why that rule makes sense. Let's now move on to the second connective we'll be covering, which is conjunction. And here, in fact, the introduction and elimination rules are much easier than for implication.
So here the introduction rule is as follows. So if you want to prove a conjunction, so you want to prove something of the form capital Phi and capital Psi, well, then we need to prove that on the one hand, Phi is true and also that Psi is true. So yeah, this introduction rule basically sounds tautological. The reason for this is that we've encoded the intuitive meaning of and inside this connective. We can again justify why this rule makes sense using truth tables. So recall that the only case where this uh, conjunction here is true is if both of the conjuncts, so both phi and psi are themselves true. And thus, if we want to prove that this is true, then we need to show that in fact, both of the conjuncts are true. Okay, so writing this down schematically with our givens. So suppose we're given phi and psi. This means that we're either given these uh, statements as hypotheses in our proof problem, or that we've somehow established them in the course of our proof already. But in any case, once we've established these two things as true, then we get to conclude that also the conjunct um, phi and psi is true. The elimination rule for conjunction is also pretty simple. So it says that if we're given a conjunction, so if we're given something of the form phi and psi, then we get to conclude well, both uh, phi and psi. Again, this has to do with the truth table definition for conjunction. So if we know that this conjunction is true, then we know that both of the conjuncts are true. So if we're given this, then we can conclude that, well, both phi and psi are true. So we can write this sort of in two different cases. So if we're given this conjunction phi and psi, well, then we can conclude either phi or alternatively, we can also conclude psi based on this conjunction. And in fact, we can do both of these steps in the same proof. Now, because these rules are so simple, and basically the symbol here just translates to and, we can sort of forget about these rules in most cases and just interpret this statement here as this statement here, which says phi and psi. To illustrate this, let's prove the following statement. So the statement would be something like, let n and m be natural numbers. And so that's sort of the general assumption. And now what we want to prove is that, so to prove that uh, n being even, and m being even, so when both of these things hold, this should imply that also the sum n plus m is even. Okay, so a proof of this could look as follows. So because we're trying to prove an implication, the first step is going to be to assume the hypotheses. So we're going to assume that, well, n is even, and also m is even. So we're assuming this conjunction here. And then I use the elimination rule. So now we're given some conjunction. So I can eliminate this uh, and here to get both individual statements. So hence n is even and also m is even. So you can see that here I've used the elimination rule, but not really much has happened. So I've just rewritten this conjunction here with uh, the word and. But that's exactly what the elimination rule is saying we're allowed to do. And now, basically, I can use these two facts separately. So before this was somehow glued together, but now I've managed to separate them, and I can now use them individually to do stuff. So now to proceed with the proof, we actually need to say what it means for a number to be even. So so because n is even, so n is equal to 2 times p um, for some natural number p, and also m is equal to 2 times, let's say, q for p and q being natural numbers. So hence, if we look at their sum, so n plus m is equal to 2p plus 2q, 
and by arithmetic this is equal to 2 times p plus q. Um, so in fact n plus m is even. The reason for this is because p plus q is also a natural number and so n plus m has the form 2 times some natural number which is the definition of being an even number. And now as a last line I could write therefore n being even and m being even implies that n plus m is even. Now as I said because these elimination and introduction rules are so simple we'll often sort of skip them meaning that in a more concise version of this proof you wouldn't say assume this conjunction and then say hence well both of these statements hold. Instead you would just directly assume that n is even and m is even. So this part here of the proof is sort of optional. You could instead just say assume that n is even and m is even. Well then and then you do the argument and so on and you conclude that n plus m is even so you've proved the implication. But for the moment it's probably helpful to write out exactly what the statement is and when you're using the introduction and elimination rules. Next let's turn to logical equivalence. Here the thing to notice is that phi if and only if psi is logically equivalent to the statement that phi implies psi and also psi implies phi. So this is one of those logical equivalences we saw in the video on propositional logic. And if you're unsure about whether this holds you should just uh, think about the truth table definition for these connectives and uh, well see for yourself. And in fact this logical equivalence gives us a way to derive introduction and elimination rules for this uh, equivalence connective based on the introduction and elimination rules for implication and conjunction. So to be explicit about this, so the introduction rule is as follows. So if you want to prove that phi if and only if psi, well then you need to prove that phi implies psi and also that psi implies phi. And the reason why this rule works is because this thing is logically equivalent to this statement and if we want to prove this statement then we use the introduction rule for the conjunction. So we say that okay in order for this to be true both of the conjuncts have to be true. So in order to prove this statement we have to prove that well, this implication holds and also that this implication holds. Okay and well the way to prove these individual implications here is using the introduction rule for implication. So you would assume first phi and then prove psi and in the second step you would then assume psi and then prove phi. So the abstract schema for this proof. So you have some givens which I'm not going to be specific about. The thing you want to prove is this equivalence, so phi if and only if psi. So the first step here is we suppose that phi holds and then we want to prove uh, psi holds and in this uh, proof of psi we're allowed to use our existing givens from outside but we're also allowed to use capital phi. And well if we manage to do that we get to conclude that phi implies psi. So that's sort of our first subproof. And then a second step we want to prove the other implication. So we're going to suppose that psi holds and the thing we want to prove is phi. And well if we manage to do that then we get to conclude that psi implies phi. Okay. And Therefore we've now proved both of these implications. So we can then use the introduction rule for conjunction. So we've proved that well this implication holds and also that this implication holds. Hence in the outermost scope we've now proved that uh, phi if and only if psi. Uh, 
Now what's important here is that these two subproofs are separate from one another. So here we're allowed to use our existing givens plus the additional assumption of phi. But in this subproof, we're no longer allowed to use this additional assumption of phi. I mean, otherwise proving phi would be trivial. Instead, this is a separate subproof that occurs at the same level as this subproof here. So here we're allowed to use this additional assumption psi together with our existing givens from outside. Now, oftentimes when people write statements, they won't write the symbol. Instead, they'll write things like if and only if or if with two f's. So alternative notations for this are if and only if as well as the abbreviation if with two f's, which uh, abbreviates the, the phrase if and only if. So the second f is coming from here. Okay, so now let's move on to the elimination rule, which I can hopefully manage to put down here. So for this, you again use the logical equivalence of this if and only if with the two implications. So this means there's sort of two ways we can eliminate this. So I'll just write it down in the schematic form. So given the uh, if and only if, together with one of the hypotheses, we can conclude the other one. So psi in this case, or alternatively, if we're given this if and only if statement, and we know that psi holds, then we can conclude phi. So the way to use this if and only if is basically like an implication, but it works in both directions. In fact, this uh, if and only if means that one is true if and only if the other is true. So in fact, you can also eliminate it in another way, because say you know that phi is false, then you can also conclude that psi is false, and conversely. So sometimes this is helpful when you're doing proofs by contradiction or proving some sort of contrapositive. So if you're given this, then this is basically saying that both of these statements have the same truth value. On the other hand, if we want to introduce the connective, so prove something of the form phi if and only if psi, then we have to do more work because we have to show that in all cases, well, the truth values of these two things will be the same, so we prove both implications. So this connective is really making a strong assertion about the relation between phi and psi. This means that we're happy if we're given a statement like this because then we can use it in a lot of ways. On the other hand, if we want to prove it, we have to put in more work because we're trying to prove something that's fairly strong. Let's now move on to discussing the rules for negation. But before that, the following general piece of advice. So the advice is that whenever you're trying to prove a negative statement, try to think about whether it doesn't make more sense to prove a corresponding equivalent positive statement. The reason for this is that usually we're not interested in things that don't hold or are false, but rather we would like to affirm that certain statements do in fact hold. So if you encounter some negated statement you're trying to prove, try to first use logical equivalences to transform it into something positive and then try to prove that. Now in many cases, you'll be pulling the negation symbol from outside to a more inside position in your formula using logical equivalences. And in some cases, it will actually vanish entirely if you do this. For example, consider the following statement that says, it's not the case that for all x, x is strictly less than a, or b is greater or equal to x. So here I have this negative statement, and now the idea is to transform it into something positive. So first I use the logical equivalence, which tells me how to pull negation operators across quantifiers. So whenever I do this, the type of the quantifier changes. So if it's not the case that for all x some statement holds, then in fact there exists some x such that the statement does not hold. So there must be a counterexample to the statement. So this statement here is logically equivalent to there exist x such that it is not the case that x is less than a or b is greater or equal than x. And now in a second step, I can use De Morgan's rule to pull this negation symbol inside the brackets across the disjunction. And um, well, this will negate the individual 
uh, disjuncts here, but it also changes this disjunction into a conjunction. So this is logically equivalent to there exists an x such that it's not the case that x is strictly less than a, and also it's not the case that b is less than or equal to x, like so. So now I've pulled the negation symbol even further into the formula, and what I'm left with are these statements here. So it's not the case that x is strictly less than a, and it's not the case that b is less than or equal to x. And while these things are individually the same as the following statements, so not x less than a is the same as that x is greater or equal than a, and the other one is the same as saying that b is strictly greater than x. Okay, so you can see here that I've somehow pulled this negation operator uh, further and further into the formula, and then I get these negated basic statements here, which in this case I can express in a positive manner by inverting the, the um, inequality sign. And here, in this case, you can see why it's nicer to try to prove this statement. So this one says that there, in fact, does exist an x with certain properties, whereas this one says that it's not the case that for all x, x has certain properties. So this is a nicer mathematical statement that more directly says what you actually want to say. In fact, this piece of advice applies more generally. So whenever you have certain givens, you can replace them with logically equivalent ones. So sometimes your given statements might be very complicated and you could simplify them using logical equivalences. And in a similar manner, if you're trying to prove a certain statement, well, then it's the same as proving any other logically equivalent statement. So you can always replace the proof goal, so the thing you want to prove, with something logically equivalent and prove that instead, and you will have established the original goal as well while doing so. So that's another very general strategy for writing proofs. You can first, if you look at your givens and the goal you want to prove, you can first try to simplify those first using logical equivalences. But if that's not possible, well, then you need to like start using these proof rules that I'm explaining now. Okay, so let's now um, give the introduction rule for negation. So if you want to prove a negated statement, so something of the form not phi, what do you do? Well, you assume that in fact phi holds and derive some sort of contradiction. So you want to derive something that's evidently false. Okay, so in that case, well, it's not possible that phi holds because if phi would hold, then we would get a contradiction. Therefore, we can conclude that in fact, phi is not the case. Or another way of saying that is, if phi were true, then we get some contradiction. Therefore, phi has to be false, so not phi is true. All right, so the schematic way of writing this would be the following. So we have some givens, and the thing we want to prove is this negation. And for our proof, we're going to, again, suppose, well, that uh, phi holds. So in this case, the thing we want to prove is a contradiction, which I write with this symbol here. The Lautech name for this symbol is perp, standing for perpendicular. So this is like uh, something standing perpendicular on something else. But this is often used for like uh, a contradiction as well. So if we can manage to establish a contradiction based on the assumption of capital phi, then we get to conclude that uh, phi is indeed not the case. Now you might be wondering what exactly a contradiction is. So a contradiction is a statement that is evidently false. So either it's a statement that we've previously established to be false, or it could be something which is always false. So an example of a contradiction could be if you get like some sort of proposition together with its negation. So if based on the assumption of phi, you can derive p and also not p at the same time, or if based on the assumption of phi, you could derive not phi, well, that would be a contradiction because the conjunction here of something with its negation is always false. But 
Oftentimes one doesn't have to go so far as to derive an explicit statement together with its negation. It might also just be enough to derive a statement that we know is false based on some other uh, considerations. For example, if we can derive a statement like zero is equal to one, then that would be a contradiction because at least for um, natural numbers, zero is not equal to one. To make some space, I've copied the introduction rule and this general schema here. And now we're going to see an example that actually uses this rule. So the hypotheses for our example are going to be the following. So we're going to be given uh, P implies Q. And the thing we want to prove is that the contrapositive of the statement holds, which is that not Q implies not P. In fact, this is one of the logical equivalences we saw in the video on propositional logic. So you could actually appeal to this logical equivalence to prove the statement. You could just rewrite either the givens or the hypotheses here using that logical equivalence and then the proof would be trivial. But in fact, it will be nicer to just write down the proof here using these proof rules. So if you want, you can treat this as an exercise. You can pause the video here and see whether you can manage to prove this statement from these givens using the rules we've established so far, including this introduction rule for negation. I'm now going to proceed to the solution. So for the proof, we notice first that we're trying to prove an implication, which means we need to use the introduction rule for implication. Remember that that one said that we assume the hypotheses of the implication and try to prove the conclusions. Okay, so we're going to suppose that not Q is the case. And the remaining thing we need to prove is that not P is in fact the case. All right, so now we're in the situation where the goal for our proof is in fact a negated statement. So we're going to use the introduction rule for negation. And it says that, well, in order to prove the negated statement, you assume the unnegated version and try to derive a contradiction. Okay, for this, we're going to suppose that P in fact holds, and now I need to find some sort of contradiction. Now there's really only one thing I can do, which is use this given implication I have. So I now am assuming that P holds, and therefore together with this implication, I can conclude that Q holds. Okay, so since P implies Q, uh, we know, well, that Q holds. On the other hand, here, my assumption is that Q does not hold. So in fact, this is already the contradiction. So, but since not Q, we have a contradiction. And this allows us to now conclude that in fact, P does not hold because we assumed P and got a contradiction, therefore P cannot be true. Okay, so this concludes my sub proof here. Now let's see what we've established. So in the beginning of the proof, we assumed not Q. And overall, in this sub proof, we managed to establish that not P. So overall, we've proved that uh, not Q implies not P. And that's exactly what we set out to do. Okay, so I hope that this introduction rule here is clear. Now there's a related um, strategy called proof by contradiction, which makes use of this rule. But it also uses the fact that double negation is equivalent to just the original statement. So the idea here is that we again have some givens. And the thing we want to prove is now not a negated statement, but in fact, just some ordinary statement phi. Now the idea behind using proof by contradiction is to assume that not phi holds and derive a contradiction, in which case you can use the introduction rule for negation to conclude that not not phi, which is logically equivalent to just phi. Okay, so for this proof by contradiction, you suppose that in fact phi does not hold and what you prove is a contradiction. And this allows you to conclude with the introduction rule for negation that it's not the case that not phi holds, like this. Okay, but this double negated uh, version of phi is logically equivalent to phi. 
So this is the same as just concluding that phi must hold. Okay, so proof by contradiction is just like a special case of the introduction rule for negation together with the fact that a double negated statement is equivalent to just the original statement. Now, as a warning, you should probably try to avoid using proof by contradiction whenever possible. So there are certain statements that you can only prove using proof by contradiction, but in many cases you can actually reformulate the problem and use different proof tactics aside from this proof by contradiction. In many cases, this reformulation will involve proving some sort of contrapositive like this, which is logically equivalent to the original implication. Basically, the reason you want to avoid proof by contradiction in many cases is because the hypothesis that you're assuming here is this not phi, which is somehow more complicated than the original statement you're trying to prove. There's an additional reason to avoid proof by contradiction whenever possible, and the reason for this is that proofs by contradiction are often non-constructive. For instance, suppose you're trying to prove that there exists some element x in your set with a certain property, in that case, a constructive proof would actually describe this x and how to find it, whereas a proof by contradiction would assume that, in fact, no such x exists in your set, and then it derives some sort of contradiction. This means that, in fact, there must be some x in your set which has that property, but you don't know how to find it based on your proof by contradiction. So the direct proof, which describes how to create such an element, is better in this case because it actually also gives you a recipe for finding such an x, whereas the indirect proof by contradiction just says that, well, there must be some x, otherwise it would be like contradictory, but on the other hand, it gives you no information on how to find it. This brings me to the elimination rule for negation, which looks kind of weird. So the elimination rule says that if you're given some statement, let's say phi, together with its negation not phi, then you get to conclude any other arbitrary statement. Now the reason this rule is valid is because you'll never be in the situation where you'll be able to prove both a statement and its negation. So basically because this situation will never occur, um, this conclusion will also never happen. So therefore we get to kind of conclude anything we want whenever this situation occurs. So it's a similar thing to what's happening if we say that a implication with false hypotheses is always true. Another way to think about this is that, well, if these are our hypotheses, then our hypotheses are always false, and therefore any implication with these hypotheses will trivially be true. We now move on to the last logical connective, aside from the quantifiers, which is this junction. Here the introduction rule is again fairly simple. So it says to prove a disjunction phi or psi, well we can prove phi or we could prove psi. So here we actually get a choice. So regardless which one of these we can manage to prove, we've always proved the disjunction phi or psi. The reason this rule makes sense again follows from the truth table definition. So this disjunction here is true if at least one of the two components is true. Therefore, if we manage to prove at least one of the two components, we can conclude the disjunction. So in our schematic way of writing things down, so suppose we're given phi, or we've managed to establish phi in the course of our proof, then we get to conclude that phi or psi holds for any other proposition psi. And in a similar manner, if we're given the other component, so if we're given psi, then we can also conclude that phi or psi holds. The elimination rule here on the other hand, is a bit more complicated. So it says the following, if we want to use a disjunction, so phi or psi, uh, to prove some other statement gamma, then we must show that 
Well, gamma follows from either of the components in the disjunction. So we must show that gamma follows from phi and also that gamma follows uh, from psi. So essentially the elimination rule here is a sort of case distinction. The reason for this is that if we know that this disjunction here is true, then we don't know which of the two um, components of the disjunction is actually true. So we know that at least one of them is true, but any one of them could also be false. So if we want to use a disjunction like this to prove some other statement, then we need to uh, split into cases. So the first case assumes that in fact phi is the component that's true, and in that case we need to show that gamma follows. And then in the second case we assume that psi is in fact the component that's true, and in that case we also need to show that the same statement gamma follows. And so in either case, regardless which of the components is true, uh, we've proved the statement gamma, so we get to conclude that even if we don't know which one of them is true, so we only have the disjunction, then the statement gamma will follow. So you can see there's somehow always a trade-off between these introduction and elimination rules. So here in the introduction rule, somehow it's really easy to introduce a disjunction, right? I mean, you can just, if you have one of the components given, you can add any other component to the disjunction and uh, prove that. But then the trade-off is that the elimination becomes much more difficult because, well, if we're given this disjunction, we don't know which one of them are true. We know that at least one is true, but we don't know which. And so we need to make sure that in either case, so if either this one is true or this one is true, we need to be able to prove the conclusions. So whenever you have a really weak introduction rule, the corresponding elimination rule needs to be strong and conversely. Let's write this down schematically. So we're supposing we're given this disjunction here and we want to prove some statement gamma. So then the way to do it is to first suppose that phi holds and we need to prove in that case that also gamma will follow. So that's the first case. And then in the second case, we suppose that psi holds and the thing we need to prove is again the same statement gamma. So if we can do both of these things, then we're allowed to conclude gamma. Okay, so let's give an example where we need to make use of this. Here what we're given are the following two statements. So we know that P or Q holds, but additionally we also know that P does not hold. So these are our givens, and the thing we want to prove is that, well, in this case, Q must hold. So if you think about this for a moment, if you know that P or Q holds, well, then at least one of the two components here holds, so either P must hold or Q must hold or both must hold. And in addition, we know that P does not hold, so therefore Q needs to hold in order for this to be true. So that's, in fact, the kind of argument we'll be writing down in the proof. Now for the proof, we're going to use this disjunction here, so we need to use the corresponding elimination rule. So the first case is that we assume P holds. So that's this first component of the disjunction there. On the other hand, we also know that P does not hold based on our givens. Um, so in that case, uh, we in fact get Q. And this proceeds by the elimination rule for negation. So remember that whenever we have this contradictory situation occurring where we have at the same time a statement and its negation, then we can conclude any other statement. So this might look a bit weird, but basically what this is saying is that, okay, suppose that P were true, but well, we know that P isn't true, so this case can't actually occur. But the way to kind of skip this case with these rules is to use the elimination rule for negation. We're saying, okay, this case can never occur, so basically in that case we can conclude that Q is true because we'll never be in this case. On the other hand, the case that actually can occur is 
that q is true, well, then, because we've already assumed q, we know that q holds. So hence q, I mean, this is redundant to write it, but we're in the case where q holds, well, q holds, so okay. But now I've shown that in either case, so in the case where we assume p, but also in the case where we assume q, we can derive q, and hence we can overall conclude q based on the elimination rule for um, the disjunction. Okay, so let's do an example where we have to use some of these various rules in combination. So in fact, we'll be proving one of De Morgan's laws using these proof rules. And the thing we want to prove here is that not p and not q. Okay, so if you want, you can again think of this as an exercise and try it out for yourself using the rules we've established so far. All right, so the first thing we're going to look at is at the statement we want to prove. So we see that the, this statement is a conjunction, so we'll want to use the introduction rule for the conjunction in order to establish this statement. So recall that in order to prove phi and psi, you need to separately both prove phi and also prove psi. Now in this case, the things we want to prove are not p and not q, and if we can establish both of those, then we've proven that not p and not q holds. So for the first part of the proof, I'm going to prove that not p holds. Now, not p is a negated statement, so in order to get the negation, I'm going to use the introduction rule for negation, which says that we assume the non-negated statement and derive a contradiction. Okay, so that's going to be the first step. So we assume that p holds, and well, then in that case, I can use the um, introduction rule for disjunction in order to conclude p or q. So then p or q also holds. But by assumption, we have that not p or q, so this contradicts the given not p or q, and hence using the introduction rule for negation, we now can derive that in fact p cannot be the case, therefore not p is the case. Okay, so hence we have that not p holds. Maybe I should put the rules I'm using here more explicitly, so in this step where I'm concluding p or q, I'm using the disjunction introduction rule. And here, from going from this contradiction here to not p, so based on the assumption of p, this is using the negation intro rule. All right, so now I've established one of the two things I need to prove. So next I need to prove not q. So this is going to be basically exactly the same argument. So I'm assuming q because I want to then use the um, negation introduction rule once I derive a contradiction. So based on q, I can conclude p or q, again using the disjunction introduction, but this is again a contradiction, so so this contradicts the given uh, not p or q, so hence we conclude not q. Okay, but now we've shown both that not p holds and also that not q holds. So in conclusion, we can now derive not p and not q. And that's what we wanted to show. All right, so this last step here, this is the introduction rule for conjunction. Okay, so that's a proof of one direction of the Morgan's law. If you want, you can try to prove the other direction for yourself. So in that case, the given would be not p and not q. And the thing you have to prove would be uh, not p or q, like so. Now, similar to how proof by contradiction was a special case of the introduction rule for negation, it turns out that a proof by cases is also a special case of the elimination rule for disjunction. So what do I mean by this? So proof by cases 
uh, works as follows. So basically, you split up all possibilities into two or more cases. So formally, this works as follows. So we have some set of givens. Okay, these could be anything. And then we have some statement we need to prove. Let's again call this gamma. And what we're now going to do is we're going to transform this problem by introducing a tautology to our givens. So we're going to add to our givens. So we have these existing ones, but now we're adding additionally something like phi or not phi. The reason we're allowed to do this is because this thing is a tautology, and so it always holds. So it's always going to be the case that phi or not phi is true, and therefore we can just assume it in our givens. Now the thing we still want to prove is gamma, but we now have some additional uh, hypotheses we can use, namely this disjunction. Now for the proof, we're going to use this disjunction using the elimination rule for disjunction. The way to do this is to first suppose that phi holds, and in that case, you need to prove gamma. Okay, and in the second case, you suppose that, well, not phi holds, and in that case, you also prove gamma. So regardless of whether phi or not phi holds, you've proved gamma, and hence you get to conclude, overall, you get to conclude that gamma holds using the elimination rule for disjunction. The reason this makes sense and why the elimination rule for disjunction is sort of like a proof by cases is because, well, here you've kind of exhausted all the possibilities, so either phi holds, in which case gamma holds, or phi doesn't hold, in which case gamma also holds, so gamma always holds. That's basically the idea behind this proof by cases. This might not seem super useful when you're just seeing it like this, but splitting up cases can be really helpful because it gives you these additional assumptions you can use in your subproof. As an exercise to uh, practice this proof by cases on your own, uh, try to prove the following statement. So we let n be some natural number, and we want to prove that n squared minus n is even. Okay, so here, this is the statement that you want to prove, but you don't have any givens other than the fact that you know that n is a natural number. So in this case, it can be very helpful to use this proof by cases, because you can split into two cases, and then in your subproof, you can make some additional assumptions about this number. And in fact, the cases you should be using is, the first case is that n is even, and the second case is that n is itself odd. And in both cases, you should be able to show that n squared minus n will be even. And so you've covered all cases, and so we can conclude that in all cases, in fact, n squared minus n is even. Finally, let's move on to the rules for the quantifiers. These have a somewhat different flavor from the rules for the connectives, basically because the quantifiers aren't defined using truth tables. Instead, we somehow have to establish that certain things hold for all elements of a set, or that there exists some element of a set for which some property holds. We'll start by looking at the universal quantifier, and here we'll start with the introduction rule. Remember that for quantifiers, we had these two versions of quantification. We had this unrestricted version of quantification, and the restricted version, which sort of said that the objects we're looking at live in some specific set. Okay, so there'll be also two versions for the introduction rule, depending on which case we're in. But let's start with the unrestricted quantification. So if we want to prove that some statement for all x, phi of x holds, so here phi of x is some formula where x occurs as a variable, and we've quantified over um, that formula using the universal quantifier. So if we want to prove this, so um, then what we need to do is we need to take some arbitrary, and I'll talk more about what arbitrary means here, we need to take an arbitrary element x and prove that phi of x holds for this arbitrary element. So, and prove phi of x for this specific choice of x. Uh, 
Now here this word arbitrary is crucial. What this means is that we're not allowed to assume anything about x other than certain things which we know to be true for arbitrary elements. So for all elements that um, live in the set we're looking at. So another way to think about this, which is maybe helpful, is well we have this set where the elements we're interested in live, and basically we kind of want to choose a random representative from this set. So here the word random or arbitrary means that we don't know anything about this element other that it lives in this set, and so we can't make any additional assumptions about it. Now because I'm not making any additional assumptions, if I can establish that this property phi of x holds for this arbitrary element, well then it shouldn't make any difference if I would have instead chosen some other element in the set x prime. So basically x being arbitrary here means that it's somehow representative, that means all of the arguments I'm using on this specific x in order to establish that it has the property phi of x need to also work for any other choice of element in the set. So if instead of having chosen this orange x, I would have chosen the green x prime, well then I should be able to perform exactly the same argument to establish that phi of x prime holds. So another way about thinking about this introduction rule here is that, well, if we want to prove some property phi of x for all x in a set, well generally there'll be like infinitely many of these x's, so we can't possibly like go through each one and check the property. But what I can do is I can somehow come up with a general argument that will hold for any element in the set regardless which one I pick. So that's what we're doing here. We're coming up with a general argument that should hold for any element in the set, and then we say, okay, if you give me some element of the set, regardless which one, I'll be able to apply this argument and show you that actually phi of x holds for this. But of course, in order for this strategy to work, I'm not allowed to make additional assumptions about this element that might not hold for all elements in the set. For instance, if I'm trying to prove something for all natural numbers, then I shouldn't assume that the number I've chosen is even or odd or something like that. Instead, the argument I provide for this arbitrary number which I choose should work for any other number regardless which one it is. Okay, so let's write down this rule in our schema. So we have some givens, which I'm not going to specify, and the thing we want to prove is something of the form for all x, phi of x holds, okay? And in this case, our proof will always start with the following phrase, so we say let x be arbitrary. And well, the thing we need to then establish, so the thing we need to prove, is that actually phi of x holds in this case for this arbitrary choice of x. So if I can give a proof of that, okay, then I get to conclude that in fact phi of x holds for all x. Because this x I've chosen here is a representative object from my set, and in this subproof here where I've established that phi of x holds, I've not used any other property aside that x well, lives in the set in question. Now that covers the rule for unrestricted quantification. The rule for restricted quantification is pretty much the same. So here we have something of the form for all x in a set A. We want that phi of x holds. Okay, so I do exactly the same thing. I take an arbitrary element x, but in this case x lives in the set A. So somehow here I have this additional piece of information that x is not actually an arbitrary, completely arbitrary object. Rather, I only want to prove the statement for x's that live in the set A. So what I do is I take an arbitrary element x in the set A, which might be like a smaller subset of a larger universe of x's, and then I need to prove again phi of x for that choice of x. Hence proving this restricted quantification here should be easier than proving the unrestricted version because in this case we actually have some additional information about x, namely that it lives in this subset A. So that covers the introduction rule for the universal quantifier. So as you can see it's quite demanding to introduce a universal quantification. You need to show that the statement in question holds for any choice of x. On the other hand, because the introduction rule is so strong, the elimination rule is much weaker, 
So it says that from a statement for all x, we have that phi x holds, uh, we can conclude, well, that phi of x holds for any x. So again, this rule sounds kind of tautological because it's expressing the meaning of this universal quantifier. So the way to think about this is that if you know that some statement phi of x holds for any x, well, then you can choose whichever x you want and conclude that for that x, phi of x holds. So maybe here I should distinguish this x from the one above. So let's say our specific choice of x is called x0. Then I can conclude for that specific x0, I can conclude phi of x0. For instance, if I know that all swans are white, and I have in front of me a specific swan called Maggie, then I can conclude that Maggie is also white. So that's what this rule is saying. Now using our schematic notation, if we're given a statement for all x phi of x holds, then I can conclude that phi of x0 holds for any element x0. So x0 is some arbitrary object of my choice. Now here again, there's a separate version for the restricted quantification. So here we need to maybe qualify things a bit more. So if I know that for all x in A, phi of x holds, well then I can still conclude that phi of x zero holds, but I need to make sure that x zero is actually an element of A, otherwise I can't make this conclusion. We're now almost done with all of the rules. We just need two more, namely for the existential quantifier. Here, hopefully, both the introduction and elimination rules are completely intuitive. So the introduction rule goes as follows. So if we want to prove that there exists x such that phi of x holds, well, what do we need to do? Well, we need to find and describe some specific element x for which phi of x holds. So we must specify some x0 um, for which phi of x0 holds. Okay. So this should make complete sense. If we want to show that there exists at least one x for which the statement phi of x holds, well then we need to point out some element x0 for which that statement actually holds, and then we've shown the existence statement. The way to write this in our schematic form is, well, the given here is that we know the statement phi of x0 for some x0, and in this case, we're allowed to conclude that there exists some x such that phi of x holds. Specifically, the x0 is one such x. There might be more, but uh, there's at least one, so we can make the existence statement. Now here there's also a restricted quantification version. So if I want to know that there exists some x in A for which phi of x holds, well then the x0 that witnesses this property needs to also lie in the set A. So if I want to show the statement there exists x in A such that phi of x holds, I need to find some x0 in the set A such that phi of x0 holds. Okay, and then we have the elimination rule. It says that if we're given the statement that there exists some x such that phi of x holds, well, then we may choose some x0 satisfying uh, phi of x0. In other words, if we know that there exists at least one x which satisfies phi of x, well then we can, you know, pick that x0, and for this we're allowed to assume that uh, it actually has this property phi, so that phi of x0 holds. So the way you would use this in a proof is as follows. So suppose I have the given that there exists x such that phi of x holds, and I want to prove that some statement gamma holds. So here, if I wanted to use this existential statement in the proof, I would start it in the following way. I would say, let x0 
mm, satisfy mm, phi of x0. Or you could also say something like, let x0 be an element satisfying phi of x0, or choose x0 in such a way that it satisfies phi of x0. We know that this is possible because of the existential statement. These are all equivalent formulations you could use. Okay, and then the thing we need to prove is still gamma, but in this case, we're now allowed to use this specific x0 with this property, which is hopefully useful, in order to establish gamma. And if we can do that, then we overall get to conclude that gamma holds because, well, we've shown that under the assumption that there is an x0 satisfying this property that gamma holds, but we also know that there in fact is at least one such x0, so overall we can conclude gamma. Now again, in this case, there's a version for the restricted quantification. So if we know here that there exists an x in A satisfying phi of x, well, then we may choose an x0, but this x0 has to lie in A and it satisfies uh, phi of x0. So in this case, we're actually getting more information again about the x0, namely that it also lies in A. So here you can again somehow observe the trade-off between the strength of introduction and elimination rules because in the case of the introduction rule, if we have this restricted quantification, then it will be harder to prove such an existential statement because we have less x's to choose from. Whereas in the elimination rule, we now get more information about this specific x if we use the elimination rule. All right, with that, we now have all the rules we need in order to write proofs in first order logic. I admit it's quite a few because we have these two rules for every uh, connective and quantifier. I hope that apart from a few exceptions, most of these rules seem intuitive to you and so they shouldn't be too hard to remember. On the other hand, if you are seeing these for the first time, um, this is probably totally overwhelming. And so in order to yeah, assist you in the process of absorbing these, I'm going to make a summary sheet which summarizes all of these rules for you. Also, if this is the first time you're seeing any of this, I doubt that my explanations here will be enough to make things click entirely. So again, I would recommend you check out this book called How to Prove It by Velimon. There you'll get much more detailed explanations of all of these rules and also many, many more examples and exercises you can try for yourself. On the other hand, if you're already doing math for a while and you've implicitly absorbed these rules, I hope that sort of covering them in this explicit manner has given you some occasion to think about these rules more and why they make sense. In fact, these rules will form the basis for the more formal proof theory, which we'll see from the next video onwards. And I hope that the, these explanations will help explain why we formally define um, our proof calculus as we do later. I'd like to conclude this admittedly very long video with a, another list of useful logical equivalences, this time including quantifiers. The reason I didn't present this earlier in the video on first order logic is because at that point we didn't have the tools to actually establish these equivalences. In fact, now we can use the proof rules we've learned about in order to prove every one of these equivalences on the list if we wanted to. The way to do this is basically to, instead of proving this equivalence like this, so this is like the logical equivalent symbol, so instead of doing that, you prove the formula which has the if and only if connective. So you replace the logical equivalence by this if and only if, and then you prove the corresponding statement. So if you want, you can think about this list here as a series of exercises for you to practice using the proof rules. I'm just going to prove one of them as an example, and I'll go through each of them and explain exactly what they mean. So the first grouping here basically involves changing the order of quantifiers if they're of the same type. And basically it's saying that you're allowed to switch the order of quantifiers as long as they're of the same type. So it's saying if you know that some statement holds for all x and for all y, it's the same as saying that some statement holds for all y and for all x. A similar remark holds for the existential quantifier, so again there the order doesn't matter. However, as a strong word of warning, this only works if the quantifiers are of the same type. So if you have like a universal quantifier and an existential quantifier, then changing their order does actually significantly alter the meaning of the statement. Okay, 
So then the second grouping here is saying how the quantifiers interact with negation. Here, for instance, we have the statement that it's not the case that for all x phi of x holds, and this is logically equivalent to the statement that there exists an x for which phi of x does not hold. The intuitive explanation here is that, well, if it's not the case that some statement holds for all x, then there must be a counterexample, so there must exist some x for which phi of x does not hold. A similar thing works for the existential quantifier. So it's not the case that there exists an x for which phi of x holds is logically equivalent to saying that for all x, it's the case that phi of x doesn't hold. Again, you can think about this in terms of counterexamples to the universal statement here. To remember these rules, you can think about pulling in the negation through the quantifier. So somehow we're moving the negation in further inside through the quantifier here, but doing so changes the type of quantifier. So if you do this with a universal quantifier, it becomes an existential quantifier. And if you do it with an existential quantifier, it becomes a universal quantifier. So this is somehow a way to move uh, negation symbols in and out over quantifiers. The final grouping here describes how quantifiers interact with conjunction and disjunction. The first statement here is saying that universal quantification distributes over conjunction, while the second statement is saying that existential quantification distributes over disjunction. In other words, it's the same thing to say that for all x, phi of x and psi of x holds. That's the same thing as saying that for all x, phi of x holds and also for all x, psi of x holds. And the similar thing goes for the existential quantifier here. As an example, I'm going to prove this uh, statement down here that uh, the existential quantifier distributes over disjunction. So remember that in order to prove an equivalence, we replace the equivalence symbol by the if and only if and then prove the corresponding statement. So in order to prove an if and only if, I need to prove two directions. And often one abbreviates this with like a left to right arrow and right to left arrow. So first I prove the left to right direction. So I'm going to suppose that there exists an x for which phi of x holds or psi of x holds. Okay, so I'm going to let x0 satisfy uh, that phi of x or psi of x holds. So I can do this by eliminating this existential quantifier here. So I can pick a specific x0 that satisfies this statement. Now I want to eliminate this disjunction here in order to prove this disjunction here. So remember that in order to prove a disjunction, it's enough to prove either one of the components. Whereas when you eliminate it, you have to show that in either case, so whether this is true or this is true, you manage to get the thing you're trying to prove. So I'm now trying to prove this based on this disjunction. So I'm going to further suppose that in fact phi of x zero holds. So here I forgot the zeros. Well, then in this case, there exists an x such that phi of x holds, okay? So also there exists an x such that phi of x holds, or there exists an x such that psi of x holds, because when I introduce a disjunction, I can uh, introduce an arbitrary other component. So if I know that this statement is true, then I also know that this disjunction is true. So this is the first case. If it is the case that, in fact, phi of x zero is true, then I can deduce that, well, there exists an x such that phi of x, and therefore also there exists an x that phi of x, or there exists an x that psi of x. Okay, so that's case one. And in case two, we assume that psi of x zero is true. And here we have exactly the symmetric situation. So in that case, there exists x such that psi of x holds because if we know that there exists an x0, then we can well, form this existential statement here by the introduction rule for the existential quantifier. And so we also have that there exists x such that uh, phi of x holds, or there exists x that psi of x holds. Okay, so I started with this disjunction and I showed that regardless which of the components is true, we can conclude this statement here. And so hence, overall, the statement holds. Okay, so that's one direction of the proof. Uh, 
So I'm running out of space here, so I'll do the other direction uh, down here. So for this direction, we assume this statement, and we want to prove this statement here. So we're going to suppose um, that there exists an x such that phi of x holds, or there exists an x such that psi of x holds. Now we're in the case where we're given a disjunction, so we'll need to use the elimination rule for disjunctions. Recall that for this, we need to show that in either case, so whether this is true or whether this is true, we can get the desired conclusion. So in the first case, so in case there exists x such that phi of x holds, um, we can uh, choose x0 satisfying uh, phi of x0. Well, in this case, we also have for this x0 that phi of x0 or psi of x0 holds by the introduction rule for disjunction. So in conclusion, there exists some x for which phi of x holds or psi of x holds by the introduction rule for the existential quantifier. Now on the other hand, in case there exists x such that psi of x holds, we can again choose an x0. So we have some uh, x0 uh, with psi of x0. So hence, also in this case, we have phi of x0 or psi of x0 by introducing a disjunction. Uh, therefore, we have that also in this case, there exists an x for which phi of x holds or psi of x holds. All right, so I've now shown that regardless which of these components holds, I can show the statement. And therefore, overall, we've now proved that this statement implies this statement over here. So if I had the additional space, I would write the extra sentence. Hence, we conclude that, in fact, there does exist some x such that phi of x holds or psi of x holds, because we've shown that in either case. And therefore, we have established the implication from right to left. Okay, so I encourage you to think about these logical equivalences, think about why they're true, and maybe also write down proofs for some of them. All right, with that, I'm done with what I wanted to say in this video. So we've seen all of the proof rules for first order logic, which are quite a few. And I've also provided you with some style guidelines and some tips on writing your own proofs. In the next video, we'll be seeing a formal counterpart to these proof rules, namely natural deduction. There we'll be building up a completely formal system where we can derive first order logic formulas using certain rules. And we'll be arguing that in fact, this system produces correct uh, conclusions. Now for understanding that system, it'll be indispensable for you to understand the proof rules in this video. So I hope that this provides a good background for that.